Here we'll learn about neuronal excitation. Start a table. To note that we'll learn the definitions for several key interrelated mediators of cellular physiology. The electrochemical gradient, the equilibrium potential, the membrane potential, and the electrochemical driving force. As well, we'll familiarize ourselves with two key calculations, the Nernst equation and the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation. Let's begin with equilibrium potential. Draw a cell membrane. Throughout this tutorial, we'll address the membrane potentials for sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium. Begin with sodium. Show that there's a far greater concentration of sodium ions outside of the cell than inside, a ratio of roughly 15 to 1. To remember this, it's helpful to imagine cellular life originating from seawater, growing up in a salty, extracellular environment. Next, balance each of the positive sodium charges with negative chloride ions. Then introduce our first channel, a sodium leak channel, which allows sodium ions to flow freely down their chemical gradient from a region of high ion concentration outside of the cell to low ion concentration inside of the cell. But chloride ions cannot pass through the channel, which creates a separation in charge, so show that a positive charge forms within the cell. This positive charge generates an electrostatic force directed in opposition to the chemical gradient. Write that at electrochemical equilibrium, the chemical and electrical gradients are balanced. Write that the equilibrium potential is the membrane potential at which an ion reaches electrochemical equilibrium. We can predict the equilibrium potential by using the Nernst equation. Write that the membrane potential is the voltage potential of the intracellular space in reference to the extracellular space. Show that with a voltmeter we can measure the membrane potential. It's simply the difference between the intracellular and extracellular voltages. We can predict the membrane potential by using the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation. Indicate that the equilibrium potential for sodium is positive 60 millivolts. Tying these three concepts together, if a cell is only permeant to a single ion, then at electrochemical equilibrium, the membrane potential is equal to the equilibrium potential of that ion. But cell membranes are permeant to many different ions, so the membrane potential actually relies on the equilibrium potential of many different ions, and these potentials are part of the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation. Even still, potassium is far and away the most permeant ion in a neuronal membrane, so although we have to account for multiple ions, the strongest influencer is potassium. So let's take a look at its electrochemical gradient. Draw another cell membrane, include a potassium leak channel. These are abundant along neuronal membranes. Show that Unlike sodium, there's a much greater concentration of potassium ions inside of the cell than outside, a ratio of roughly 35 to 1. Again, balance those charges with chloride ions. Show that when a potassium channel opens, there's an efflux of ions out of the neuron, which creates a negative charge within the cell. Draw an opposing electrical gradient. Draw a voltmeter and indicate that the membrane potential of potassium is negative 90 millivolts, which, as we'll see, is similar to the neuronal membrane potential. Let's address the neuronal membrane potential now. Draw a neuronal cell body. Show that sodium has a high extracellular concentration and a low intracellular concentration. Indicate that sodium enters the cell via leak channels down its concentration gradient, and include the opposing electrostatic gradient. Show that potassium has a low extracellular concentration and a high intracellular concentration. Show that at rest, potassium exits the cell via leak channels along its concentration gradient and include an opposing electrostatic gradient. As mentioned, potassium leak channels dominate the permeance of the resting neuronal cell membrane. So, Draw a voltmeter and indicate that the resting membrane potential is around negative 70 millivolts. Now introduce the sodium-potassium ATPase pump, which resets the ion concentrations. Show that it redistributes three sodium ions out of the cell for every two potassium ions it pulls back in. 
indicate that the sodium potassium ATPase pump requires energy in the form of ATP because it's an active transporter. Lastly, let's include chloride, show that chloride has a high extracellular concentration and a low intracellular concentration, ratio of roughly 11 to 1. Indicate that it has a concentration gradient directed into the cell body and an opposing electrostatic gradient. Show that chloride has an equilibrium potential of roughly negative 80 millivolts, which is fairly close to the membrane potential itself, which brings us to the concept of electrochemical driving force. Write that the electrochemical driving force is a measure of the electromotive force on an ion. To calculate driving force, show that we subtract the equilibrium potential from the membrane potential. The greater the difference between the two potentials, the greater the driving force. Show that chloride has a low driving force because the equilibrium potential for chloride is very near to the neuronal membrane potential. Now let's learn the basic cellular physiology of neuronal signaling. Let's draw a synapse, which comprises a presynaptic cell foot process, the axon terminal, the postsynaptic cell dendrite, the target, and the synaptic cleft between the two. Draw a synaptic vesicle in the presynaptic cell and fill it with neurotransmitters, which provide communication between the pre- and postsynaptic cells. Draw a voltage-gated calcium ion channel, then show an action potential travel down the presynaptic cell axon and depolarize the axon terminal through sodium influx, which ultimately triggers voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open. Calcium has an extracellular to intracellular concentration ratio of greater than 10,000 to 1 and a very large driving force. Indicate that calcium ions rush into the cell and initiate a signaling cascade wherein synaptic vesicles fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Next, draw a postsynaptic ligand-gated neurotransmitter-activated sodium ion channel. Show neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft to a receptor on the channel, triggering it to open. This, for example, represents glutamate binding to NMDA receptors on the sodium channel. Indicate that sodium ions then enter the postsynaptic cell down their electrochemical gradient, which slightly depolarizes the postsynaptic membrane. It makes it more positive. Draw voltage-gated sodium channels and show that when the depolarization reaches a certain voltage threshold, these channels open. Sodium rushes into the cell, which causes further depolarization in a feed-forward cycle. Indicate that this positive feedback system of depolarization propagates the action potential down the membrane, passing the signal from one neuron to the next. So let's take a closer look at action potentials, which are depolarization signals that operate over long distances, along an axon. They are all-or-nothing events, like firing a gun. Let's create a graph, label the x-axis as time in milliseconds, and label the y-axis as membrane potential in millivolts. Mark several specific voltages. First indicate that at time zero, the resting state membrane potential is at negative 70 millivolts. Write that the voltage-gated ion channels are closed, and that potassium leak channels are the driving force. They drive the membrane potential towards the equilibrium potential of potassium. Then at time one millisecond, show via a graded depolarization, the membrane potential slowly becomes less negative. It depolarizes due to the opening of ligand-gated ion channels. Indicate that at negative 55 millivolts, the depolarization starts a steep climb, reflecting a rapid depolarization. Mark this value as the threshold. Write that during depolarization, ligand-gated sodium channels open, followed by voltage-gated sodium channels with rapid opening at threshold at negative 55 millivolts. The membrane potential rapidly increases and peaks about positive 30 millivolts, nearing towards the equilibrium potential for sodium. For repolarization, show that at 2 milliseconds, the potential reverses and drops. There's increasing negativity of the membrane potential.
right? That repolarization reflects that at this time, the sodium channels are becoming inactivated, which means that even if the membrane potential is above threshold, they cannot open, they are inactive. And the voltage-gated potassium channels are now opening. Show that there's hyperpolarization of the membrane potential. The sodium channels are closed and the voltage-gated potassium channels remain open. Finally indicate that the membrane potential returns to its resting state. At this point, the voltage-gated potassium channels are closed and only the leak potassium channels are open. For completeness, demarcate the absolute refractory period, which begins when the voltage reaches threshold and ends during repolarization. No stimulus, no matter how strong, can cause another action potential during this time period. Then demarcate the relative refractory period, which is the time when the sodium channels are recovering from inactivation and the potassium channels remain open. Finally, as a clinical corollary, let's consider some anti-epileptic drug mechanisms of action. They block the excessive or asynchronous neuronal discharges that generate seizures. First, indicate that phenobarbital and benzodiazepines accentuate chloride channel hyperpolarization. Then, indicate that phenytoin and carbamazepine bind to and prolong voltage-gated sodium channel inactivation. They lengthen the refractory period. Finally, indicate that one of the key roles of felbamate is that it blocks the activation of postsynaptic ligand-gated sodium ion channels. It prevents postsynaptic membrane depolarization. We learn more about anti-epileptic drugs elsewhere. This concludes our diagram.